Καλώ ήρθατε σε αυτό το τρομερό βίντεο. Είναι παλιό, πραγματικά έχει απίστευτου τόνου πληροφοριών. Έχει ουσιαστικά πω τον Τζον Μακτούγκαλ, ο γιατρό, ο οποίο γιατρό, έπαιρνε ανθρώπου οι οποίοι είχαν πέραν φαρμακευτική αγωγή για παθή τη καρδιά, για, χα... για υψηλή πίεση, για να ρίξει τη χολυστερίνη. Αυτά τα κλασικά χάβια που παίρνει ο κόσμο που έχει πρόβλημα με τη χολυστερίνη. Λοιπόν, να τα αποφύγει αυτά, πραγματικά είναι ένα βίντεο που έχει άπειρο, άπειρο ενδιαφέρον. Και θα σα διαβάσω μερικά πράγματα στατιστικά από το Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Είναι από το CDC τη Αμερική. Και ουσιαστικά έχει 610.000 άνθρωποι πεθαίνουν από πάθηση τη καρδιά κάθε χρόνο. Ένα στου τέσσερι θανάτου. Πε μου, ποιον άνθρωπο ξέρει στην Ελλάδα και δεν σου. Γενικά, πε τον περίγυρό σου. Έχει ακούσει για κάποιο συγγενή, για κάποιο φίλο, φίλου συγγενή. Έχει ακούσει σίγουρα για έναν άνθρωπο ο οποίο πέθανε από κάποια πάθηση τη καρδιά. Ή έπαθε κάποια πάθηση τη καρδιά. Λέει, η, ουσιαστικά είναι ο νούμερο ένα, number one killer, ο νούμερο ένα φωνιά στην Αμερική. Έχουμε τα στατιστικά, από εκεί τα δικά μα στατιστικά δεν ξέρω που είναι, αν ξέρει που μπορεί να βρει περισσότερε πληροφορίε για την Ελλάδα, α το link από κάτω. Και η coronary heart disease, πάνω από 370.000 ανθρώπου ετησίω σκοτώνει και περίπου 735.000 Αμερικανοί έχουν heart attack. Έμφραγμα. Δεν είναι art attack αυτή η τρομερή εκπομπή που έβλεπε, ξέρω με διάφορα, διάφορα καλλιτεχνικά, αν το θέλει. Είναι πραγματικά είναι πολύ σοβαρό. Πάρε την υγεία σου στα χέρια σου, συμβουλεύσου του γιατρού, οι οποίοι σου λένε ότι μπορεί να ζήσει όντω ω vegan, γιατί είναι πολύ γιατί δεν έχουν μερικά ακόμα. Έχουν κάποια συμφέροντα τα οποία είναι από τι φαρμακοβιομηχανίε, οι οποίε σου γράφουν το τάδε φάρμακο, παίρνουν τον πόνου του. Είναι, είναι το σημείο που βρισκόμαστε αυτή τη στιγμή. Όπω έλεγε ο Ιωκράτη, η τροφή σου είναι το φάρμακό σου και το φάρμακό σου η τροφή σου. Απλά, απλά δε σε αυτό το βίντεο, άφησε τα σχόλιά σου από κάτω. Περισσότερα βίντεο έρχονται με το συγκεκριμένο θέμα. Είναι πολύ σημαντικό να το ξέρουμε όλοι. Είναι πολύ σημαντικό να ενημερωθούμε. Ψάχνουμε και αυτό για του υπότιτλου. Αν κάποιο μπορεί να κάνει μετάφραση από τα αγγλικά στα ελληνικά, α αφήσει το link από κάτω, α αφήσει το όνομά του από κάτω, α μου στείλει μήνυμα στον Ασβό. Το βίντεο ξεκινάει μέσα τώρα. Hello, I'm John McDougall. I'm a medical doctor and an internal medicine specialist. I have the great privilege of bringing you this videotape of segments from a television show that I've been involved with for the past four years. These segments are short capsules of information that will inspire you to a healthier, happier life. The first segment is a bit longer than the rest. It was shot at St. Lena Hospital and Health Center in Northern California. It explains my background and philosophy. It's hard to imagine a more appropriate setting for getting well and staying healthy than the Napa Valley in Northern California. On a mountainside overlooking the valley is St. Helena Hospital and Health Center, operated by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Long a leader in lifestyle-oriented health plans, it's the home of the McDougall Program, a diet-centered approach to health conditioning directed by Dr. John McDougall. The program balances lecture sessions with nutritious meals and exercise. Steve Wynn investigates. I've never felt better in my life. Before I came to this program, I could hardly walk from the kitchen to the front room. But since being on this program for about eight days, I feel like a new person. I would recommend this program to any of my friends. I really enjoyed the people that were there in the program, the staff of the, the St. Helena Center. Dr. McDougall gives personal attention to each program participant, pointing out the signs of progress as his lifestyle plan begins to bring results. We wondered how he first came to focus so strongly on the role of nutrition in good health. A young man walked into my office and he said to me, Dr. McDougall, do you think diet has anything to do with the illnesses of your patients? Well, I said, absolutely not. And he said, well, how come you're so sure? And I said, well, look, I went to one of the best medical schools in the country. And I said, If it was important, they would have talked about it. And I said, they didn't mention it. So everybody who walked in the office, I would say, what do you eat? You know, ask them how they live. You know, and check their health over and so on. And I was in a very, very unique situation. I probably couldn't have duplicated this experience in any place else in the world. In his practice on a large plantation in Hawaii, Dr. McDougall witnessed the lifestyle contrast between different cultures and age groups. 
The insights he gained there helped to inspire his two books as well as the McDougall program. And what I saw were the first generation who stayed on a diet of rice and vegetables, no medications. They could see perfectly, they could hear perfectly. Trim, healthy, hardworking people into their 70s and 80s and sometimes 90s. Their kids were fat, they had the gout, the diabetes, the blood pressure, the heart disease, the cancers, and so on that I had learned in medical school. So that gave me the first indication that disease is really not primarily an inherited thing. Members of the hospital staff provide specialized assistance to Dr. McDougall. Terence Hansen, Vice President for Health Programs, explains why this program is so welcome at the health center. Uh, the McDougall program fits very well with us philosophically uh, in the services that it offers and it, and it in, indeed expands uh, some of the people that we can help. The McDougall program is a lifestyle change program. It's a 12-day program. The people come here and stay. They live in the health center. Uh, they're taught a diet that's starch-based, high-complex carbohydrate diet. They exercise. They have group therapy. They uh, interact with each other and uh, have a good time. But the key thing is changing their lifestyle, and we give them the support to do that. They do have a full-service acute hospital here, but the, the hospital administration is also committed to prevention. Surgery is just a Band-Aid. It takes care of the person now, buys a little time, but if they don't change their lifestyle, they end up right back on the operating table. The message that I try and get people to think of in terms of properly nourishing themselves is that there's a diet that best supports human health and that diet is centered around starch like rice or potatoes or sweet potatoes corn taro with vegetables and fruits and then there's another category of foods called delicacies which are the candy bars and the cakes and the chickens and the fishes and so on if you think about it for a minute that's the way it used to be Mm -hmm. And you feast on occasion if you're in good health. But if you're in trouble because you've been feasting 21 times a week for most of your life, then you need to stop feasting for a while to get your health back. Herb and Jerry Harrison are recent graduates of the McDougall program. I think I noticed a change after about four days. And the principal thing was I had stopped taking all my pills by the third day. And the fourth day I felt just as good as when I was taking the pills, maybe even a little bit better. I have a greater outlook. My disposition's always been great, but I feel better anyway about it. Looking forward to the next day, and not necessarily the next meal, but the next day. I think one of the good things about the McDougall program, that a lot of, uh, and this is a lifestyle, this is not a diet, but when, you're, when people start losing weight and start, uh, you know, in tendency towards dieting on this, uh, you're given different quantities that you must weigh or you must count or you must, you know, do something like this. And with this, you just eat, you know, the quantity of food that you want of any particular food. And that's, uh, that's different and still losing weight, so that's a plus. A demonstration that I like to give people is to show them these glass stomachs. And these stomachs uh, are, are representations of what the actual stomach looks like as far as size and each of the stomachs contains 500 calories worth of food. Now you're trying to fill the stomach up. If you have 500 calories worth of salad dressing, it's just a little puddle in the bottom of the stomach and it doesn't fill anyone up. 500 calories worth of meat or cheese, likewise, is hardly any filling at all for that stomach. Whereas when you get into rice and corn and potatoes, they really start to fill the stomach up when you put in four to 500 calories of these foods and that's what you're looking for. One of the questions that comes up is Dr. McDougall offers kind of solid uh, evidence to support his approach to total wellness. It's a diet that's described in the Bible. And actually, the medical treatment I use is clearly laid out in the first chapter of Daniel when Daniel took his men who were living in the king's care. And he said to the gatekeeper, he said, let's do an experiment. Very scientific. Let's do an experiment. Let's take these men who are living under the king's roof, eating the rich foods, and let's put them on pulses and water, which are vegetable and water. And they agreed. And Ten days later, they evaluated their experiment, and their complexions were clear, and their health was returned once they gave up the rich food. 2,500 years ago, people made that observation. It's as true today as it was then. And you know something? In about 10 days, we get almost everybody off of blood pressure pills, diabetic medications, heart medications, 
and they've lost a considerable amount of weight in that period of time. Mm. I suppose I should just give Daniel the credit, right? Each year, 1.25 million people have heart attacks that could have been prevented. Fortunately, you don't have to be one of these statistics if you listen to the advice of the experts you're about to hear. Afterwards, I'll give you some timely information about aspirin and fish oil. Bob, uh, can you tell me how you got interested in the aspect of children and heart disease and cholesterol? Well, actually, my interest in heart disease began with a family history of my own. My dad had died at 57 of a coronary. Both his brother and sister have uh, the same disease. At 35, I had a heart attack and bypass. At 41, I had a second bypass. That led me to a real investigation of ways to get cholesterol under control, since cholesterol was the culprit. I was able to do so very well for myself, and then just very uh, recently after my second bypass, I had my son tested. Ross's level at age seven was already elevated, and I realized that something had to be done. I went back to the literature and found out that, in truth, America is sitting on a bit of a time bomb in terms of our children. You know, most people think that heart disease is a disease of 40, 50, 60 year olds. But what you're talking about is the disease of little kids. Let's talk specifically. I mean, actual foods that raise cholesterol. The foods that raise cholesterol the most are the saturated fats. Those are the ones found in butter fat, cheese, whole milk, ice cream, red meat. Uh, we also see it in coconut oil, some of the hidden oils that are used in shortening, coconut oil, palm, palm kernel oils. Those are highly saturated, but also the actual cholesterol in food, in egg yolks and so forth, the animal foods, all of these raise cholesterol levels. And we really should make a concerted effort to bring those down in our diets. Common advice, Bob, is to switch from red meat to chicken and fish. Lots of Americans are doing it. Actually, how much cholesterol are they getting when they switch from red meat to chicken and fish? The cholesterol content isn't that far off. It'll be just about the same within a reasonable number of milligrams. The difference is in the saturated fat. So the recommendation is quite uh, prudent to cut back on the amount of red meat. Doesn't mean you have to eliminate it entirely, but cut it back considerably. Replace it with fish, with uh, chicken, with poultry of all sorts. Uh, definitely go into some of the dried beans and peas. Go back to some of the old traditional ways of cooking, lentil soups, split pea soups, those delicious barley stews and so forth, because those foods not only don't raise cholesterol, they actually lower it. Bob, how about parents who don't want to feed their kids turkey and chicken? They have health concerns about these foods. What about those parents? Are they doing all right? I think that's per perfectly fine. It's a, it's a matter of finding what fits you. And I address the issue of the vegetarian diet, for example, within the book. I think it's a very helpful way of living. Uh, for those who want to do so, it's a wonderful way to stay healthy and happy for the rest of your life. Dr. Blankenhorn, you're one of the world's experts on atherosclerosis. I think we ought to start by telling people exactly what atherosclerosis is. John, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, what atherosclerosis is, is a buildup of cholesterol and scar tissue on the inside of arteries that interferes with the passage of blood. So we're talking about closing those arteries down. Right. All right, what's the consequence? The consequence is the common heart attack, the myocardial infarction, it's called, or stroke, or the like. Those are the major consequences. All right. And is this a very common thing to happen to people in this country? Yes, as you know, it's the common cause of death in this country today. All right. How about somebody like me, somebody who's young, trim? Could I have atherosclerosis? Yeah, the chances are you have less than uh, somebody who smokes or who has high blood pressure or high cholesterol, yeah. All right, so the chances are I might have it. Uh, say I didn't want to have any more of it. You got any words of wisdom on how I might stop Well, yeah, stopping? the words of, I'm sorry to cut you off here. The words of wisdom I had where I have are that uh, uh, you should lower your cholesterol. You should get your blood pressure down, and you should never smoke. All right. Now, one of the key words that you mentioned is something that everybody's hearing a lot about, and that is to lower their cholesterol. What we're talking about is blood cholesterol here. How do I get my cholesterol lower without uh, just wishing it so? Right. The, the things to do are to eat the right diet, eat low cholesterol, low fat foods, and those are principally the vegetables, and then avoid the uh, high cholesterol foods, and the high, one of the highest is the egg yolk.
All right. Uh, what about if what if I just want to have no cholesterol on my diet? What would I eat? Well, you can eat uh, a very reasonable diet with very small amounts of cholesterol. And the thing to do is to limit the amount of uh, meat you're eating and go for low-fat dairy products. Okay. Now, say uh, we were going to talk about ideals here, and I decided to watch my cholesterol level, and the object was to lower that cholesterol level. What's my goal? I think you should have a cholesterol of at least about 150. That's a good goal. 150, 150 milligrams per cent. All right. I eat no cholesterol in my diet. My cholesterol is 220. What do I do next? Well, in that situation, you need to consult with your doctor, and there are some people whose cholesterol levels are set high by their metabolism, and then they need medical care, and they need to take drugs. So cholesterol-lowering drugs. So the diet first, and then cholesterol-lowering drugs, and my goal is to get it down to 150. What's the prize if I do? The prize is you're going to have uh, no uh, increase in your atherosclerosis, and I think you find your disease is reversible. So, in other words, my arteries are going to get healthier and stronger? Right. Am I going to open up those holes so the blood can go through easier? I think so. All right. How about strokes and heart attacks? my wife going to have a husband a little longer? I think she will. I think you'll cut your risk. Uh, you can cut it way down. Okay. Let me see if I've got this right. We're going to watch our blood cholesterol. We're going to eat healthy foods. We're going to get some exercise. We're not going to smoke. I mean, that sounds like a message that nobody could argue with. John, I agree with you. Thank you very much for being here, Dr. Blankenhart. I mean, to present such a positive message to our viewers has been a real pleasure for me. We hear talk these days about the possibility of reducing heart disease and stroke by using aspirin. Is that right, John? There's some truth in that, Dan. And it's important information for people to know about and to put in perspective. Now, this all started about 20 years ago when scientists discovered that if you take aspirin, what happens is that aspirin inhibits blood clotting by inactivating platelets. And what happens is, in a sense, the blood becomes thinned out and has less tendency to form clots. Now, that's important because what happens in the final stages of a heart attack is one of those heart arteries forms a clot, no more blood can go through, and the little heart muscle dies. And so if you can inhibit that clotting, if you can prevent the blood from sticking together and form those clots, which you can do with aspirin, then you should be able to reduce your risk of heart attack. Now, there have been many studies done, and the general conclusion is this. If you take aspirin on a regular basis, and we're talking here usually about every day, if you take aspirin every day, then you reduce your risk of a non-fatal heart attack or stroke, that means not dying but suffering, by about 30%. How many aspirins would you say? Well, it depends, you know. It's interesting. When they did studies taking three aspirin a day, they didn't get any better results than when they took one aspirin a day. You reduce your risk of dying of heart attack and stroke by about 15%. Now, knowing that you have a variation in dose, what we have to consider now is we have to consider what happens when you take large doses or any dose. Because when you take drugs, you know, there are effects that you want, positive effects, and then there are side effects. Aspirin has side effects. What are those? Well, you know, people get indigestion, burning gastritis. They get irritation so bad in the stomach because they bleed and sometimes they can hemorrhage and it could be fatal in very rare cases. Some people are allergic to aspirin. So it's not without consequences that you make the decision to take aspirin to prevent heart disease. Now, some of the better decisions that I think you can make is I don't think you need three aspirin a day. As a matter of fact, you do just as well by the studies with one aspirin a day. And one thing you might want to know is even taking one little baby aspirin a day will inhibit all the plates, platelets in your body and then it should be just as effective as an adult aspirin to take. Now, you also have choices in adult aspirin. You can take the regular adult aspirin or you can take the coated adult aspirins and the coated adult aspirins are easier on the stomach. So there are some choices for you there if you do decide that that's the way you want to deal with heart disease. I hear you saying that we're not dealing with an aspirin deficiency though in this problem. Exactly right, Dan. I mean, heart disease is not due to lack of aspirin in our system. It's, it's a treatment is what it is. What we ought to be doing is we ought to be doing, dealing with the cause of the problem. And the cause of the problem we know, the Heart Association tells us, and uh, other scientists and doctors tell us, and it has to do with the cholesterol and fat in our diet, the amount of meat and dairy and eggs that we eat. We ought to change those rich eating habits to eating no cholesterol and low-fat foods like rice and potatoes and fruits and vegetables, and then we're dealing with the problem. So the problem was with the spoon and the fork and the knife, and not because we poke ourselves in the heart with it. You got it. You got it. Thank you very much, John.
health trend in America's diet is to replace beef with fish. But consider these foods have nutritional characteristics that are very similar. They're all muscles. Basically, we're talking about the muscle of a cow, a pig, a chicken, or a fish. They're high in fat and or high in protein. They're low in fiber, contain no carbohydrate, and they're highly contaminated because they're high on the food chain. And one thing that will really surprise you is they all are very high in cholesterol. You should keep fish as a delicacy just like you would chicken and beef and pork. The active ingredient in fish is the fish oil, and manufacturers put these oils in pills and sell them to you in drug stores and health food stores. Now, there are some positive effects of these fish oils. They do lower your cholesterol, and they will lower your triglycerides, and people who have arthritis will experience benefits. It will decrease the inflammation of the arthritis. But there are some adverse effects to these pills, as there are with so many other pills, and you ought to know about the downsides taking fish oils for your health problems. Fish oils are very high in calories. These oils are the highest concentration of calories that you can buy. What we're talking about here is we're talking about a pill that contains solid oil. I've had patients who have decided to take fish oils as a treatment for their cholesterol, and they have gained eight pounds in two months. Other adverse effects of fish oil is the way they work is they thin your blood, and some people can get bleeding tendencies when they take fish oils as a treatment of disease. Remember the time-honored fish oil, cod liver oil? We're talking about an oil that has very high levels of vitamin A and D, and some people can develop vitamin A and D toxicity. There are better ways of dealing with your health problems. Instead of taking a pill to solve your cholesterol and triglyceride trouble, instead of taking a pill for your arthritis, deal with the cause of the problem. Cut the cholesterol out of the diet. Eat a healthy diet that supports your health. This health phase all starts with the Eskimos. Sure, they have less heart disease, but they've got other problems. They have problems with obesity. They have the highest incidence of osteoporosis in the world. There's a better choice, and the choice is, is to use fish for what it really is. It's a delicacy. It's something for special occasions. It shouldn't be the center part of your meal plan. Instead, what you should do is center your meals around starches like rice and potatoes and add fruits and vegetables and use fish for a very small part of your meal plan just like the Asians do. And then you'll enjoy good health, very low risk of heart disease, and you'll look and feel good just like you should. The rich American diet places a tremendous burden on our health, and the result is an epidemic of illnesses that include high blood pressure, osteoporosis, and adult-type diabetes. My interview with author and medical expert Dr. Julian Whitaker leads things off with some pretty startling information. In this country, about 5% of the population, or about 6 to 7 million people, suffer from diabetes. 90% uh, of those 5 to 7 million people have what we call non-insulin-dependent diabetes. In other words, they have a type of diabetes that does not require insulin injection. Do you have any idea what causes diabetes? Well, back in the 30s, it was demonstrated that if you have a lot of fat in your diet, that the fat causes the insulin that is being produced by the pancreas to be insensitive. So basically, because the American diet is so high in fat, we eat food which blocks the sensitivity of insulin. Many of these diabetics, uh, John, actually have an elevated insulin level in the blood, along with elevated blood sugar, which is like a misnomer. But in reality, because of their obesity and because of the high fat in their blood, the insulin doesn't work and the blood sugar level goes up. Would you expect that people who eat lower fat diets in other parts of the world are going to have less diabetes? Not only would I expect that, but that is exactly true. You take countries like Japan or particularly countries in, in Africa or the undeveloped countries which are eating primarily carbohydrates, low in animal protein and low in fat, diabetes is not only rare, it is almost unheard of. Now what you're telling me is that we can prevent adult type diabetes by staying away from the fatty foods. What if we take somebody who already has diabetes, an adult diabetic, what if we change them to that other kind of diet, that low-fat diet where diabetes is so rare? What would happen? Well, that's what we've been doing. We've been doing that for almost 15 years, where we'll take the obese diabetic and put him on a low-fat diet, exercise regimen, and in those you can get about 80% of them off of insulin if they're taking insulin. And if they will follow the regimen continually, their, the tendency towards diabetes will just be eliminated in 80 to 90 percent of those individuals that follow the regimen. How about the patients? Do you think if they knew about this option, they'd do it? 
Now, we're dealing with human beings, and when you ask people to make changes, you know and I know that sometimes they'll make changes for a while, and then they'll backslide, and they'll, they'll, they'll remotivate, and they'll rededicate. But in general, what we try to do is to offer them the best uh, approach so that they understand that there is an option. Then they can take more responsibility for their care, more responsibility for their health, more responsibility for their success, and they're not kind of tied to a paternalistic system where they check in regularly just to get medication. Dr. Swank, just to start off, could you give us a capsule summary of what multiple sclerosis is? Well, it's a disease which involves primarily the central nervous system, that is the brain and spinal cord. And clinically, it is a, it's characterized by uh, period, periodic attacks in which uh, some neurological symptom develops and stabilizes and then followed by what we call a remission. In other words, the condition gets better. Sometimes it gets very much better so that the patient considers that he's completely recovered. Other time he only gets partially recovered from the attack. But these attacks keep on recurring periodically, on average about one per year per patient over the long haul. And uh, they can involve um, any, any part of the nervous system involved. It could be blindness, for example, of one eye, double vision, for example. There can be uh, numbness and tingling of extremities or weakness of a leg or stiffness of a leg. There can also be a lot of um, incoordination so that the hands will shake violently or even the body and the head will shake violently. And uh, then, of course, uh, dizziness is a common enough symptom. Uh, these uh, symptoms come uh, with varying intensity and then disappear. And uh, as the disease progresses over a period of years, the patient gradually becomes um, disabled and uh, finds that he can no longer walk or he has great difficulty walking and finally may come to a wheelchair and then continue, of course, to slowly deteriorate. Do you know of any effective treatments to stop multiple sclerosis? Yes, I believe so. We use a low-fat diet in the treatment of these patients. We've been using it now since 1948, and uh, we have a series of patients, 150 patients, which we have followed for uh, going on to 40 years now, and which was reported at the end of 34 years of treatment. And these patients who were started early enough on treatment before they were disabled have done exceedingly well, and most of them have avoided disability. Now, you've just explained to us the benefits of a good diet and a good lifestyle in multiple sclerosis. These are simple things that patients can do for themselves. I want to know about treatments that doctors give patients, like medications. Are those effective? Well, no, I don't believe so. Uh, there's been a great deal of uh, prednisone, and other corticoid, corticoid, cortical, uh, other steroid treatments used, and uh, ACTH, uh, the uh, material which stimulates the production of, of uh, corticosteroids. Uh, these have been used, and they do, on occasion, give some benefit short term. But in the long term treatment of the disease, they are useless. And also, they are apt to produce a lot of nervous tension, which is sometimes is counterproductive in these patients. Now, in practical terms, what have you seen happen to multiple sclerosis patients that accept this low-fat diet? In practical terms, they do very well. If you can make the diagnosis early and get them on diet early, they do exceedingly well. And our statistics in the group of 150 patients which we treated over a period of 40 years, and which we reported at the end of 34 years, is that 95% uh, of the early cases, those who are not disabled, uh, who followed diet carefully, 95% of them were ambulant and quite active at the end of that period. And how does this compare with patients who do not follow a low-fat diet? Well, at the end of that period, 90% of them approximately were dead. And those patients who maintain a low-fat diet can expect to remain at the same activity level? 95% of them were essentially the same. There was a factor of aging coming in here because they were now 
approaching 90, 70 years of age, and they weren't quite as active as they were when we placed them on the diet, but they still uh, had, they were no more disability, disabled than the average person at that age. How strictly do you have to follow this low-fat diet? That is the problem. The problem is that a patient has to follow it strictly and steadily. Now, there's an interesting thing that happens here that I think we should bring out. That is, the patient doesn't follow the diet strictly. In other words, he's 10 grams or 20 grams over the diet. He will not have an increase in exacerbations. He'll go along just the same way without an exacerbation, and we'll get the idea that he can eat that much fat without getting into trouble. But actually, what happens is he soon starts going downhill rapidly, and once that starts, there's no, it's very difficult to stop. What kind of dietary regime do you work out for people who come to see you with MS? We've worked this out pretty carefully at, uh, and have published it in book form. Uh, it's a diet which contains less than 15 grams of fat, of animal fat, and we uh, have substituted a We've not insisted, but we have recommended that the patients uh, eat uh, somewhere around 15 to 20 grams of oil, that is a vegetable type oil, and it contains about 60, uh, 60 to 80 grams of protein and the rest uh, carbohydrates uh, as much as a patient needs in order to keep up their energy and to meet the requirements of their, of their job in life. Today I have the very great privilege to introduce you to the man who opened my eyes about the cause of disease and also the possible cure of common diseases that affect people in our country. This was back in 1971 that I met Dr. Dennis Burkett. Dr. Burkett, welcome to the show. Can you tell me when and what kind of training that you received? Kennedy College, Dublin, between 19... 30 and 35. I went up to the medical school. I went up to the university in Dublin in 1929. Decided I'd do anything in the world except be a doctor or a dentist. And I, I, I entered the engineering school and I did engineering for a year. And it was during my first year I felt very definitely called to give it up and take up medicine. And I have never ever for one moment regretted that decision. I was a surgeon fundamentally for all my professional life. But over the last 20 years, just over, I, got, I switched entirely from trying to cure disease to go 100% into trying to prevent disease. Because it wasn't until I came back from 20 years surgical practice in Africa that I was helped largely by others to appreciate that most of the common chronic diseases filling the hospital beds in Western countries today are rare or unknown in the third world were there even in North America before the First World War, are equally common in black and white Americans, and therefore they have to be due to our lifestyle, the way we live, and in which case they've got to be preventable if we can identify the factors in our lifestyle. All right, now you discovered the relationship between diet and disease from your experience in Africa and looking around the world. Now, what exactly is the part of the diet that you identified as the cause? To begin with, we talked about fiber, but then we realized we were far too blinkered. If you look at the, the diet of disease of the countries throughout the world, who don't get the common diseases of Western culture. And when I say the common diseases, I mean diseases like atherosclerosis, diabetes, gallstones, bowel cancer, breast cancer, hemorrhoids, varicose veins, diverticular disease, huge pile of stuff. The countries who don't get these diseases have a diet with far more starch, far more fiber, far less fat, far less sugar, far less salt. And the two major things we need is to eat more fiber and less fat. All right, now if you were going to advise people on the diet to eat, what kind of meal plan would you tell them to eat? The two most important ones would be to eat far more fiber. The average American eats 15 grams a day. Our ancestors used to eat over 100. In much of the third world, they eat over 100. The first thing would be to eat more fiber. The second thing would be to eat far more starch. Now, people are afraid of starch. They think starch is fattening. It's never fattening. More bread, more potatoes, more pasta. Uh, all those starchy foods, and, and more fiber and more starch. 
then far less fat. I think that might almost come top of the list. We eat 45% of our total energy as fat, and it's nearly all saturated animal fat. Um, if we could cut down our fat by going, say, shall we say, on the skim, semi-skimmed milk, um, a vegetable of, um, margarines rather than butter, uh, abolish fried food as far as possible, and something which we've only recently recognized uh, is that meat grown on the farm in our country or yours has seven times as much fat on the carcass as wild meat, and five times as much of that fat is the more dangerous saturated fat. Okay, in terms of practical everyday foods, can you give us some foods that you'd like to see people eat more of? I think we ought to eat far more foods made of cereals in general, particularly bread. Our ancestors ate between a pound, about a pound and a quarter per head per day of bread, always brown flour. We in Europe, in England, eat under a quarter of a pound a day. I think bread is a, a brown bread, not white bread. Brown or wholemeal bread is a very healthy diet. I like to see. Now, peas and beans are extraordinarily good because they're high in soluble fiber, which is good from the point of view of diabetes and coronary heart disease. I think potatoes are very good. They're high in potassium. And Western man is the only mammal alive who eats more uh, sodium than potassium. I think potatoes, as long as they are neither cooked or eaten with fat, are a slimming diet, are very nutritious. They tell me that there's almost no other diet which can contains almost everything a human being uh, needs. I, I, I mean, vegetables and fruits are all good, but most fruits, of course, is 98% water, so you don't get a lot of, a lot of um, uh, fiber in it. Um, but it, also, uh, cereal is a good source of protein. I'm not a dietitian. I'm just, I mean, I'm a surgeon who's coming by the back door, but I, this is just what I think about it. I think of osteoporosis, and I think of a little old lady, if I can say that, curled up over a cane. Dr. John McDougall is here to tell us if that's true, false, somewhere in between. When you say osteoporosis, what is it? Well, just the fact that you say you have that picture tells you what a common disease it is, or at least the knowledge of it is so common. I think the first thing that we have to start out with is the fact that osteoporosis is a disease. In other words, it's not a natural part of getting older. The way women were designed is their bones are supposed to last till they're 80, 85 years old, just like the rest of their body. But the way it is today, you know, bones are dissolving away at 40, 45, 50, Why? 55. Well, there are lots of theories out there, and unfortunately, some of these theories are tied to business, to economics. For example, the idea that it's a lack of calcium. Very common. In fact, I would guess that most listeners out there believe that the problem is not enough calcium, and the solution is to drink extra milk and to take various kinds of antacids. Well, the popular press, and you see the commercials, they do indicate you take a certain antacid or you eat this or that, and it's going to make a difference. You really mention it. You see the commercials. Most of that message is commercial, either direct or indirect. You know, if you look through the scientific literature, what you find is the scientific literature tells us that there's plenty of calcium in the food. I'm talking about rice, potatoes, vegetables, fruits. There's plenty of calcium in the food. And adding extra calcium really doesn't make a difference as far as bone strength goes. And I think probably one of the most interesting things that's recently come out is an article in the British Medical Journal. It was January 1989. Two different issues they carried this article that was titled Calcium Supplementation of the Diet not justified by present evidence. And they go through and they review the literature on calcium intake and how it affects the bones. And their conclusion is, is calcium does not build stronger bones, as the advertisers would like us to believe. I mean, after all, what are they selling us? They're selling us lots of dairy products. They're selling us lots of antacids with uh, uh, calcium in them. They're selling us other types of calcium pills. Uh, they have a vested interest in it. Well, what about all of these other supplements we've got here well, on the table? There, these, these, these are calcium supplements. You know, they kind of fit in with the type of belief that people have in this country, and that is that diseases that we suffer from are due to deficiencies. And so people take supplements such as these. They take uh, megadose vitamins. They worry about getting enough protein and so on. But the truth of the matter is, Lena, is we don't know people with deficiency diseases. I mean, we 
don't have any friends with scurvy, beriberi, pellagra, none of your relatives went to the doctor with protein deficiency this year. What we have in our society are diseases of excess, such as excess calories. So that's causing the bones to weaken? Well, it's not excess calories. We have problems of excess calories, excess fat, uh, excess salt, and so on. It's another excess, a dietary excess that's washing the bones away. And in this case, it's excess protein intake, particularly animal protein intake. And the studies that have been done since the 1930s show this. But I think one of the interesting things that people can relate to is worldwide occurrence of this disease. Think about the places where people consume the least calcium. I think to mind would come your a African and your Asian countries. And if you think about the teeth and bones of these people, you know, based on what you've seen in travels or travel logs, or if you study it like I have, you find the strongest teeth and bones are in your Asian and African people while they live in these countries and eat a rural type of diet where they have lots of rice and corn and uh, other types of grains and fruits, and meat intake is very small, and so is dairy product intake. In fact, they don't consume dairy products until they move to Western society. Well, I've certainly got to the age where I'm worried about this. Thank you very much for giving us the information. You would be amazed to find out how quickly what you eat affects your body. Dr. John McDougall is here to explain just, I guess, how amazed we should be. How quick is it? Tell me, have you ever known people who decided to skip lunch because they noticed they got sleepy and sluggish after they ate? I have. All right, now what I want to do is I want to explain to you what happens. If you sit down and eat a high fat meal, that fat in that meal has a direct impact upon how your blood flows. Now I want to show you something here on the screen and this is very important for you to watch. What we have is we have the blood circulation flowing here very rapidly. And it goes through the blood vessels and the blood cells, they hit and they bounce off each other and they don't stick at all. The way it should be. Yeah, that's the way it's supposed to be. That's normal circulation. Now, these tapes that you're looking at here are taken from guinea pigs, but we see the same thing in people when we look through the whites of their eyes. Now, when you feed them a diet that has 67% of the calories as fat, then what you see is the circulation sticking together and sludging. And as a result, the blood flow is much decreased to the tissues. And what happens is you actually decrease the amount of oxygen in the blood by about 20%. That looks and like rush hour oh, now. This sludging effect lasts for hours. And actually, the blood doesn't return to normal for about 10 to 12 hours. So what happens is somebody sits down and eats a typical American diet, their blood cells stick together, they feel sleepy and sluggish. Well, that's, you know, a day-to-day -day impact. But can you imagine what would happen if you took somebody who had narrowed arteries to their heart or to their brain and you took and you caused the blood to sludge like this? What happens is people get chest pain and they also get little tiny strokes as a result of that. So it's very important that we take and we feed patients who are sick from these diseases a healthy diet. What and that's that a low-fat diet. Well, that's a diet that has lots of rice and potatoes and keeps things like dairy products and meat products and even vegetable oils to a minimum. Otherwise, what happens is you get this sludging of the circulation and a, a serious compromise in the patient's health. Now, it's unfortunate, Lena, that if you have a friend or a relative that goes in the hospital and suffers a heart attack, that often the meal that they're served the next morning is one too high in fat content that could actually have an effect on the outcome of the patient. But people are learning about this. I mean, after all, we've come a long way in the study of heart disease. People know about cholesterol and they're learning about fat. And pretty soon they're going to understand the immediate effect of what you eat upon the circulation and proper changes are taking place. And if you have the option between skipping lunch and having a high fat lunch, skip lunch? Well, I got a better idea for you. Have something like a low fat soup or a sandwich that skips the butter and skips the cheese and instead has sliced tomatoes and lettuce on it. That's the way to go. Okay, I will remember that at lunchtime today. There are many nutritional myths that keep people from a healthy diet. For instance, if you believe milk and meat are necessary for a strong healthy body, you're going to find the next segments challenging. John, are vegetarians getting enough calcium? Definitely, Dan. Definitely they're getting enough calcium. And you know, I know a lot of listeners out there are thinking, well, he's talking about vegetarians that consume lots of dairy products. No, I'm not. I'm talking about vegetarians that avoid dairy products completely and instead have a diet with lots of rice and potatoes and various kinds of vegetables. Now, I know this is shocking, but it's very important that you get this message. For one reason, consuming some of those high-source calcium products like dairy products 
could be dangerous. You've been told, for example, by the Heart Association that the fat and dairy products can lead to heart attacks, and the Cancer Society tells you the way to reduce your risk of breast, colon, and prostate cancers, to cut down on dairy products. So you really need to know the honest facts about calcium in foods. Now, the fact is this. Calcium is a mineral that's in the ground, just like other minerals, like iron, for example. And the way it gets into horses and hippopotamuses and, and people is it gets dissolved in the, in the ground into a uh, liquid, and it goes up into the roots of plants, and it becomes parts of the plants, mm. like the leaves and the stalks and the fruits and so on. And then the elephant or the cow or the horse or the person comes along and eats the plant. And you see what huge skeletons some of these animals grow by just eating plants. Wait a minute, you just, you just gave me a thought. Those elephants are getting that firsthand, and if we eat the dairy product, we're getting the calcium secondhand. That's, that's right, and we're getting also a lot of other things that we really don't want to have. Now, the way it works is this. We eat the calcium, okay, and it goes through our intestinal tract, and our intestinal tract has active cells that reach out and grab that calcium. Our intestinal tract is not a passive sieve. In other words, some people have the idea if you put more calcium in, then it's just going to go into the body. That's not the way it works. And fortunately, that's not the way it works. Not only does this active intestine guarantee that you'll always get enough calcium, and I know that, Dan, because there's never been a case of dietary calcium deficiency ever reported in people. I know you might be thinking about another disease, osteoporosis, but there never has been such a disease. If you take in too much calcium, that intestine also blocks out that excess calcium it took in. So the food is right, and our intestinal tract is right, and you can't lose, and that's what you need to know. The food is beautiful, John. The facts are interesting but challenging, and I just want to thank you for giving us this to think about. We hear a lot about the negatives of the typical American diet of meat and potatoes, a diet full of fats and cholesterol, and recently, the Beef Council has taken the initiative in trying to convince us that beef is not so bad after all. What do you think about that, John? I think they're trying to convince us, Dan. I really do. I'd like to hear what some of their facts are. Well, here's a piece, 12 myths about beef. And let me just give you the first one here. It says, myth, beef is high in cholesterol. And it goes on to compare it with lots of other kinds of meat, like uh, roast chicken is even higher in cholesterol than is beef. Are they not telling us the truth? Well, they are telling the truth, and I think it's a message that we all have to get, and that is that, depending on your comparison, pork and chicken can be higher in cholesterol than beef. But here we're talking about beef being 73 milligrams of cholesterol for 3.5 ounces, and chicken being 74 milligrams, and maybe pork being 79. In other words, what they're telling us, Dan, is all these meats are essentially the same in their cholesterol level. And so many Americans out there, they believe that if they switch from beef and pork to, say, chicken and fish, they're lowering their cholesterol content in their diet, and they're not. So I have to thank the beef industry for pointing that out. All these muscles are very similar. In fact, if you look at this platter, Dan, what you see is they all look very similar. So we have pork, we have beef, we have chicken over here. We also have some other high cholesterol foods like your cheeses and your shrimps. Now compare that, contrast that with the fruits that we have over here. Look at all the colors that we have here and the difference uh, in the shapes and the textures. And you can imagine the aromas and tastes would be quite a bit different. And so the beef industry is not lying to us, but we should look at their message and not look at it as an applause for beef, yeah. but as something that condemns the other products or puts them in their place. I mean, these things are supposed to be for special occasions if you eat them at all, like Thanksgiving. I've heard you tell us that we ought to have a very low cholesterol diet or a no cholesterol diet. So you would give us a different message about including any of this in our diet at all, wouldn't you? Yeah, I think, you know, it's a, it's a message that if people stop and think about it for a minute. I mean, turkeys for Thanksgiving. And birthday cakes are for birthdays. And really, beef and pork and chicken and a lobster dinner should be for a very special occasion if you're going to have it at all. But you know something? I bet if you go around and ask people, you will find that most people have feasted enough for a lifetime. And they could take a break on feast for a while. Uh, now, are you telling me that uh, you would say turkey for Thanksgiving? Well, maybe you if want you it choose. for Christmas, too, and a lot of other. Maybe you have a lot of treats, though. So. Well, that's why Americans are in trouble. It's because they love birthday, and they love Thanksgiving. So they do it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and they look like people who have a feast three times a day, 21 times a week, and those people are the kings and queens, you know, with the gout in their feet, they're fat, because they have taken this message from the beef industry and the rest of the, the food markets, and they've decided that this is fun food, and we're going to eat it all the time, and they get sick.
Well, John, you've given us a lot of food for thought, and I'm sure our viewers are going to give some careful consideration to the counsel you have shared with us. So what do we got here, John? Looks to me like the diet point of this is you can't get your spoon into these dishes here. I've got a demonstration for you, Dan, that you're never going to forget. This is a demonstration that I give at St. Lena Hospital Health Center to the people I take care of. It's a demonstration that's going to prove beyond a doubt the problem is not that we eat too much. I mean, you hear that all the time, that the reason people are fat is because they eat too much. What I want to show you, and through your powers of observation, you will conclude it's what we eat, not how much we eat. Now, what I have here, Dan, is I have stomachs, and these are about the size oh, of really? your stomach. Yeah, these are glass stomachs. You've got to use your imagination a little bit, all okay. right? Now, what I'm going to allow you to do is to eat 500 calories per meal, and I'm going to give you different choices of food to fill your stomach with, and remember, all you get is 500 calories. For your first meal, Dan, I'm going to give you 500 calories of butter. Do you feel pretty satisfied? You feel like your stomach's no, no, full? You can have it. You don't like butter. Okay. Well, I just want to show you what 500 calories of butter would do as far as filling your stomach. And this mm -hmm. could also be 500 calories of olive oil or salad dressing that have the same amount of filling, not much, and you'd be very hungry and want more to eat. Now, if we chose, say, 500 calories of meat, that's all the fuller your stomach would get on 500 calories of meat. You would still be yearning more to eat. Are, are, you, are you telling me now what I'm responding to when I eat is hunger that is exhibited by the fact my stomach isn't full? That's right. The way you satisfy your hunger primarily is by filling up your stomach. And so that's what you want to accomplish at every meal is to fill up your stomach. The average person will burn uh, 1,500 to 3,000 3, calories a day. And so if we divide the meals up into 500 calorie meals, it gives you some idea of what you might choose for, say, breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Here's 500 calories of cheese. Again, you know, you're not looking at very much to fill your stomach up. Now, these are what people often think of as dieting foods, as meat and cheese. But they don't do much as far as filling the stomach. Let's take a look here at 500 calories of rice. And that could be white rice or brown rice. Of course, brown rice is healthier. A lot more filling. You're a lot more satisfied. Here's 500 calories of corn. Now, that is a lot of food. And here, Dan, I couldn't put 500 calories of potatoes in here. I could only put 400 calories in. So you've got to imagine the extra potatoes sitting up here and not able to fit in the stomach. So you see, Dan, when people switch from these types of foods that are so concentrated in calories to these kinds of foods that are so bulky and dilute in calories, what happens is dieting and weight loss is effortless. You want to get to dessert, I'm right? A, I, I want you to get over here quick. All right. You have a choice. Here's 500 calories of a candy dessert. Not much satis satisfaction there. Or here you could have 500 calories of very colorful fruits for dessert. That's the kind of choice you have. Now, when people figure this out, that all you have to do is switch from the high-fat foods to the foods that are, are, that are plentiful in starches, vegetables, and fruits, they take in twice as much food and half as many calories. All of this is 500 calories. 500 calories. Uh, I'll start in right now. Thanks, John. There are certain things in life people don't want to give up, like the joy of dining out with friends or the convenience of fast food. Well, I say you don't have to give those things up. You just have to be smart about it. And here are some ideas. When we first talked about doing a segment for Christian Lifestyle Magazine on how to eat healthfully in restaurants, they asked me which restaurant I'd like to use. And when I told them, they were really surprised. You see, this is not the kind of restaurant one normally thinks of when they want to eat a vegetarian diet. But just between you and me, I like to eat in places like this, and let me show you why. I'd like to have baked potato, no butter, no sour cream. I want steamed vegetables. Again, hold the butter, rice pilaf, and I'd like the salad bar. Now, does the soup come with the salad bar? Yes. As a matter of fact, the pasta bar and soup bar comes with the entire fresh fruit and salad bar. Now, wasn't that easy? This is one of my favorite salad bars. I can just go crazy here. You start out with a little green salad, maybe add a couple of extra tomatoes. You can uh, use some green pepper here. Now, you've got to be a little careful with the potato salad and some of the other salads because they're loaded with mayonnaise and oils. I like to add a few extra peas, uh, some wax beans, yeah? like wax beans a lot. And some kidney beans and a little bit of corn. And we'll top it off with a few sprouts. And just for a little bit of extra flavor, we'll just sprinkle a little bit of this on. Now let's go see what's on the other side. 
Uh, you notice we're going to pass this, which is full of a mayonnaise-type dressing, and of course, pass the eggs up. And this salad doesn't look like it's so full of oil, so let's try a little bit here. And we'll pass the cottage cheese and the eggs and, oh, little trees. Love little trees. And maybe a couple onions. And a few more green beans here. Now, I just, I have to give up because my plate's full. And look what we have here, a vegetarian minestrone soup. Boy, was I happy to find out that they have noodles made without eggs here. And take a look at this marinara sauce. This is rich, red, delicious marinara sauce. I mean, how could you ask for anything tastier than this? Now, here's the rest of your order.